recording. All right, same time. Perfect timing, Alyssa. Um, captions are available down at the bottom of the Zoom screen if you need them. If there are other access issues that we can meet or help you think through, uh, you can put them in the chat. The chat is open to everyone, unlike the other COSIs. Um, but you can DM any one of the three of us who are spotlighted if you have other access needs. Uh, so we'll talk for, I don't really know how long, 20 or minutes or so, and maybe fewer minutes. And then we really wanna open this up for conversation. Okay, so we are three librarians, as I said. Um, and we want to talk about our discipline, information literacy, and thinking about the world of information um, kind of broadly, but also like, where are we in this current moment with information in the media landscape and mis and disinformation? Um, so I wanna kind of center us in um, what I've been thinking about a lot since October 7th, but that I kind of have been thinking about a lot just like in my profession. Um, is something that I heard in a podcast uh, where Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's an abolitionist geographer and just like general badass, was interviewed. And the question she was asked is, how did you become the person that you are? And she told a story of growing up and she said, I've never really slept much. And what I remember when I was a young girl is I would think about things in the world and I would think, how do you know that? So she spent a lot of time like rooting herself in um, what she knew and how she knew it. And it sounds like a very philosophical question and it is epistemology. But for me, for us as librarians, really the question of like, how do you know things is also rooted in our work. So. How do you know the information you know? How did you find it? Who published it? What's behind that publisher? Is it an algorithm? Is it money? Is it like, is there bias? Of course there's bias. But really like keeping coming back to the question of how do we know the things that we know? Um, what else do I wanna say about that? Oh, so in this moment, it's interesting to bring that question up because things that we think should be highly knowable, like did a hospital get bombed, have seemed to not be so easily knowable. And then things that are less knowable, like what does the phrase from the river to the sea mean, um, are also highly disputed. So one is material, did a hospital get bombed, is a material thing that, we sh that should be fairly easy to know. And yet it seemed like it wasn't in October and November. Um, and then immaterial things, I guess we'll just continue to argue about as, as humans, and that's part of being human. Um, and then the last thing that has come up recently for me, I went to a talk at Encore by Jesse Hagopian, and he was talking about a concept called epistemicide. Epistemicide is um, related to ep epistemology, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, but it's the idea that um, that like an entire knowledge system can be devalued in our culture. And I think that there that that's at play in the media landscape right now too. The media landscape, scholarly publishing, book publishing, um, and the way that we talk to and relate to one another is in thinking about our our backgrounds, our cultural backgrounds, and how we know the things we know from our families and our cultures, um, clashing with those of each other, um, and being re that clash being reinforced by media and the information landscape. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And I am gonna hand off to Greta to talk more about that. I wonder if, if maybe it actually makes more sense for Elisa to talk about her thing first. Yeah, sure. Is that okay, Elisa? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say a, a few words about um, just thinking about algorithms 
and the spread of myths and disinformation. So we are all, um, you know, on the internet, on social media, reading the news, um, and a lot of information is just coming at us and we're also interacting with it um, in a very quick way. Um, but the thing, the thing with social media is it's really nice to get some real-time information from people on the ground, but also it's just so easy for something that's um, a rumor or um, something intentionally false um, being spread um, widely. Um, so I just wanted y'all to just think about the algorithms that you are, um, that we are being uh, served and targeted by information. Um, so, you know, part of this is um, social media companies are trying to make a profit. They're not really in the, in the uh, service of trying to, um, you fact check, although there has been some efforts recently. Um, and we also play a role in, in feeding the algorithms in the way that we engage with information. So for example, um, even just scrolling and pausing on a social media post, that gets counted. So if you're watching something, even just for a moment, um, it'll, it'll log that. Um, if you like something, if you share it via message or um, reshare it to your uh, your social media feeds, um, all of that is feeding the algorithm, and it's also um, teaching the algorithm what to, to send you. So the more that you might engage in some questionable material, the more questionable material will be served to you. Um, also, like. We're creating filter bubbles just by, um, you know, choosing who we follow, who we trust, who we listen to. Um, and sometimes filter bubbles is a great way to build a community um, with people who are like minded. But also we that um, really puts us in a position where we may not be exposed to other um, experiences, opinions, um, other ways of living in the world. Um, so just to say that one strategy for this is to kind of slow down when you're um, when you're consuming news, when you're consuming social media content, um, and being more intentional about how. Um, we engage with the information that, that we see. Um, some of the librarians at Seattle Central are also doing a, um, we're working on a grant funded by NSF. What is it called? Co-designing for trust. And so we're actually currently developing a toolkit all about um, mis and disinformation and the research that we've done um, with our community in the Seattle Central, um, talking to students and faculty and staff about how they um, interact with information. And some of the things that we've learned from that, um, that identity is really important um, when it comes to um, receiving news and information and that um, when we've talked about evaluating sources in the past um, often identity is left out of the equation but now we're seeing that it's better to teach information liter literacy skills and source evaluation when you account for personal context when encountering info so your race your socioeconomic status um how uh religious background, that type of thing. Um, 
Also, we've noticed that um, community and relationships are very important. Um, and that gets to um, who do you go to to discuss the news or who do you uh, trust to provide you with good information. Um, and there's also um, an aspect of skills when it comes to evaluating sources and um, interacting with news and social media. Um, for example, us as librarians, this is our life's work. So we have a lot of practice um, sorting through information, thinking it through, um, sorting fact from opinion or biased um, um, writings. Um, and I also think that we're lucky in that we're our colleagues and like, for example, in my social media feeds, I'm following a lot of other librarians and educators. And so my social media feeds are actually, I think pretty um, reliable sources, um, but I know that's not the case for everybody. I'll stop there. I'd love to hear more um, from you all, what you're thinking about how we encounter and interact with information. Yeah, and then I just had one piece that I wanted to kind of talk about, which is um, the maybe kind of going back to what Katie was talking about, the like how we know what we know, um, the dominant narrative and then counter narratives. Um, I guess one example I'm thinking of is like, like a history textbook from the 1990s versus the an indigenous people's history of the United States. Um, so the dominant narrative would be the history textbook from the 90s and the counter narrative would be the indigenous people's history of the United States. Um, and I think in this moment, like also thinking about what Elisa was saying about the importance of identity and um, in how you know what you know, I, I think about the Holocaust narrative um, that I kind of grew up with as a Jewish person. Um, and something I've been thinking about a lot lately is the way that the Holocaust narrative has been divorced from its historical context um, and the historical context of other European perpetrated genocides, fascism, colonialism. Um, and I think that the way that it has been that the dominant narrative of the way we talk about the Holocaust in the Jewish community has kind of led to a re-traumatization of the younger generations. Um, just, yeah, really thinking about the, and like there's this emotional power that narrative has. Um, and whether that's, you know, narrative within a smaller identity community or like dominant narrative of the dominant culture. Um, the stories tap into this emotional em emotional power um, for people. And yeah, I think that's all that I wanted to say, but. Uh... Should I read my quote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, are you gonna read that quote? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I'm going to read you guys this quote from an article in Jewish Currents, which is an example of a media source that I look to a lot. It's a leftist Jewish publication that does news and also interpretation and analysis. Um, and this is a piece from 2021, actually, by Hannah Black. And she wrote, the post-70s Holocaust industry tended to remove the genocide from its historical locus within the European struggle over fascism and communism instead reifying it into a kind of ersatz spirituality of the abyss. Really like that phrasing, the ersatz spirituality of the abyss, um, because it's like, it's a black hole you can get stuck looking into. Um, and then she says, thus the potential overlaps between Jewish experiences of fascism and other struggles against imperialist domination were rendered inoperative compared to a Zionist narrative of salvation.
Thanks, Greta. And thanks, Elisa. Um, so I, I think summing up this first bit, it's thinking about um, who we are, where we come from, how we know the things we know, philosophically and information literacy wise, um, kind of fed by the things that Elisa was talking about, the spread of mis and disinformation, um, algorithms and the choices that we make in, in our information media world. Um, and then really Greta's piece about cultural narratives, but also um, master narrative versus counter narrative, bring us to places where we are kind of information isolated from one another in, in what looks like kind of a polarized world in this moment. Um, and it's by design, folks. Uh, so we want to move on and talk about um, where, where we are looking for information, where we're finding credible information, maybe where we're finding not credible information. Um, and Kano, I see your piece in the chat. I think let's get to that in a minute. Um, Greta or Elisa, or me, I can talk about this. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about what we are reading, watching, listening to in this moment and like who we feel like we can trust? Or not trust. And then we want to hear this from you all too. Um, should I start? Does anybody else want to go? You should go. You should talk about the uh, the New York Times also. <laughs> the effing New York Times. Um, okay, I had to think really a lot about this because I'm like, how did I come to this, like my political analysis of this moment? And I think like, okay, here's what I do every time. You got to go to the folks you know and respect. You got to look up your Ruthie Wilson Gilmore's, Miriam Kaba's, your, um, for me, activist people of color and listen. And for me, the listening happens on Instagram. I'm not like a big social media user, but I don't use Twitter. Um, so I think that's where I started October 7th when I was like, I don't know how to think about this. I don't know what's going on. I went to mostly black activist communities and scholars to see like, okay, help me form a political analysis of this moment. Um, and then I found that I, I learned the master narrative and I had to learn, a lot. I learned a lot about the Zionist master narrative, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, academically and culturally. So I had to like kind of unscrew a lot of things in my mind and do unlearning. I found books in the library to help me with that. Um, and then I'm a big newsletter fan, weirdly. It sounds like such an old like form of communication, but I read mostly Miriam Kaba and Kelly Hayes newsletters that come out seemingly weekly or with Kelly Hayes like every few days. Um, I know newsletters are making a comeback. Love it, love it, love it. Um, and so that's kind of where I am. And maybe Elisa or Greta will talk about this. We talked the three of us a lot about like also knowing when to stop looking at information. So I'll leave that maybe for someone else. I'll, I'll jump off from that. Um, I, I do put a lot of boundaries around the time I spend reading and learning um, about what's happening in Palestine. And I think it has been a practice that I've been um, doing better at since the 2016 election, since uh, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and what are what, what other sad things have been happening? But like, um, yeah, I, I have timers on my social media accounts. I check um, different news websites, um, but I don't, I can't spiral into um into the abyss. 
Um, I like Katie, I also have been listening to a lot of um, women of color uh, activists and, you know, I've been following them for years. So now I feel like um, I really trust the information that they are providing now. Um, and I, I actually feel like I've been reading a lot of books more so than consuming current news content um, in order to learn the historical context of Palestine and um, Israel and just learning about root causes of things and um, the timeline of how things have happened and when. Um, and the thing with like books, of course, we have to think about who's, whose books am I reading? Whose history am I reading? So I've been, um, I've been pri prioritizing first person accounts from uh, Palestinians. I've been, um, I really like uh, the publishers, uh, Verso Books and Haymarket. And there's another one. Um, those are indie um, uh, publishing companies and they often provide free ebook copies about something that's current in the news. So I've gotten like, um, Palestine, a socialist introduction by Samaya Abad and Brian Bean. I got that, a copy of that for free from one of those publishers. I read 10 Myths About Israel. Um, I don't know how to say his name uh, correctly. Elon Pape, um, who's a well-known scholar. Um, so yeah. Greta, but what about you? Um, I mean, I resonate with all the things that both of you said. I guess, yeah, we didn't talk about the effing New York Times explicitly yet. Um, I just realized I didn't talk about the effing New York Times. Go ahead, Greta. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess just like I can paste a link to this article that talks about their, I, I don't know how many people um, have followed this, but they, there was like an internal memo or like internal style guide that was leaked recently that um, that revealed the way that they uh, refused to use like certain words like genocide to talk about what's happening um, in Gaza. And also that, oops, sorry, my light just went out. Dang automatic lights. Um, but okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, and then there's also like some of the earliest coverage that they provided um, after October 7th has like pretty much been totally debunked and they've still not issued a retraction. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, but yeah, thank you for pasting that link in there, Katie. Um, yeah, I guess the only other thing that I would bring up again is like the identity aspect. Like I talked about how I look to Jewish currents, um, and the other thing I, I was thinking about is like for me looking at information coming out of Jewish Voice, Voice for Peace, but like I already knew and trusted Jewish Voice for Peace from like way before this. But if somebody now is like, oh, what is this Jewish Voice for Peace thing? If you Google Jewish Voice for Peace, one of the first, if not the first results that comes up is actually a article from the Anti-Defamation League league describing JVP as a hate group. So if you don't know, and this this is wrong, you know, the ADL is a racist organization um, that is, uh, you know, wrongly describing JVP as a hate group. Um, but if you'd never heard of JVP before and you just Google them and this is what you find, it's gonna be pretty confusing for you. You know, then, then you need to go down and say like, okay, now I need to Google the ADL. So it's kind of this like back and forth of like, which like I need to keep finding out more information of each of these different organizations that have kind of been pit against each other via my Google search. Um, yeah, so that's that's the other thing that I'm thinking about. Okay, we would love to hear from you all. I'm backing up in the chat to 
Kano's first comment. Kano, do you want to talk about the things you put in the chat? I love them. Oh, yes. Um, let me see. What did I put in the chat? Um, it's really just lately I've been experiencing Mimi Cook's writing so hard um, and the experience of feeling seen and cared for in this moment of crisis has felt so transformative. And the way she frames that care as a necessary intervention in just by naming the structures of unbelievable violence that we are living in in this current moment. Um, she speaks especially to the student experience and how um, in any given student space someone is in crisis. Um, student, The student life is just, it's so much crisis, it's so much stress buildup in the body. Um, and I think contextualizing that to um, how the model minority myth has acted on my body and the bodies of other second generation or first generation, 1.5 generation, other Asian Americans. Um, I think that analysis has really helped me see just how deep the dominant, the don the dominant narrative infiltrates um, in the case of the model minority myth. There's um yeah, like Mimi Cook descri describes how that intergenerational trauma actually works and how the model minority myth is the ideology that underpins that. Um, yeah, so I think for me um, in this moment, the way that applies to my media consumption is I'm just trying to make sense of this um, in a way that aligns with my principles and values and in a way that I think is ethical, anti-racist, um, like leaves room for solidarity, leaves room for me to recognize the full humanity of everyone trying to survive this current moment together. Um, yeah, so I think I've been leaning a little bit away from um, formally academic um, works about about the current situation, like, yes, I could pull up my old Jasper Puar PRFs and PDFs, and they'll tell me so much um, because she's done the work on the ground in Gaza around the checkpoints, but also that's so hard. And I want to imagine what care looks like, what care looks like for um, my Palestinian friends who have family over there who um, are just so navigating the world has been terrifying for them um yeah yeah that's how i am choosing what media i consume i hope that is helpful for someone else too thank you for sharing that i think um is caroline next on stack go ahead caroline hey everyone Evidence. very aggressively eating my lunch off camera um <clears throat> i'm just thinking about what elisa was saying about social media and like the boundaries that uh you've had to put on it um since basically the 2016 election and um i feel the same it's also been really s surprising to me or I don't know, notable maybe that a lot of people that, not surprising, but notable that a lot of people that I follow in social media at that time, like specifically around the Women's March, are people that I have continued to follow. And um, like Linda Sarsour and Tamika Mallory, and um, I don't know anything about how the Women's March leadership like unraveled. I know that something happened, but um, I'm not up to date on that and it's kind of like water under the bridge I think now but um how these ideas of the way that we interact with history and society are circular that I've seen go around like three times since that election and um with the Black Lives Matter movement and what's happening now and the connection between the Palestinian support of the Black Lives Matter movement um like how to make your communities safe from certain kinds of aggressive tactics from law enforcement um so it's been like everything is everything you know 
um, and like Ijeoma Lua, Adrian Marie Brown, who are people who have come and spoken to Seattle colleges and that we have had interactions with their work and in person, face to face, and also through reading them and how like these ideas of pain and care continue to be relevant because um, it's like a constant of human experience, like the good and the bad. Um, the love and the oppression. So um, I guess it's, I just, working in the place that we work, doing the work that we do as librarians, so true. Like, okay, I'm going to Google what this person said, and then I'm going to Google what this person said. And like the level of critical analysis is necessary to understand what's going on in a disinformation campaign and how our professional background and practice of doing that, like through 75 instruction sessions of crap like will like do inform the way that I think about and trust information and like the takeaway that I always tell students you know is it's like I'm sorry if I feel like I'm making you paranoid but you should be and um <laughs> you know it's like thinking of like this is what thinking about thinking is this is what metacognition is um and like really becoming a person that you can trust your own analysis, becoming a person that you can um, pay attention to the niggling doubts in your mind when you're like, you know, consuming or interacting with information. Um, and also just like how then to like respond to be in conversation with those um, ideas, whether it's on social media, in the classroom, like when we have a speaker, like how can we learn with each other and support each other to be who we want to be to have the kind of lives that we want all people to have instead of it being like I unfollow this person I cancel this person like I disagree with you so I mean for lack of better term terminology like learning how to call in instead of call out and be called in instead of be defensive like how to have conversations with people where you both actually get to learn and then move forward together as support um and i i do think that's one of the benefits of social media is that you can create community and support in the di digital atmosphere that wouldn't necessarily be available to you in your irl community like like how many palestinians from the diaspora are here or are from the places that we grew up. Like I'm from Portland, Oregon. Like there's like not that many people there, period. <laughs> so um, it's just been making me think about how our information literacy background is like critical in this moment, but also how you can feel like a alarm that just needs to be turned off by people. Um, so yeah, like social media boomed so hard after the 2016 elections. And I think a lot of political consciousness have been changed in the last 10-ish years. Um, and the problems that we are learning have been existing for hundreds or thousands of years already, like are circular and like, it's almost like the cyclone just speeds up by the disinformation. So like thinking about what Greta mentioned about how the New York Times is creating um, like how they stay away from certain words, how they stay away from certain angles. Um, and, you know, like when I began my career, I would have said, like, you can look to the New York Times. And now I don't feel as comfortable making that recommendation, not just because, because if this is how they're covering this issue, how are they covering anything else? Like if you have to agreed as a, as like a, Pulitzer Prize winning institution of over 100 years in this nation, like how can I trust that institution to be thorough or truthful or compassionate to the truths of the world? So um, I appreciate this conversation and um, just the nuance which like social media really does have such a huge place in our lives and, pre and pretending that we're better than that <laughs> is like not of use, you know, um, 
like the ways that it's it's good and the ways that it's harmful and just to have a lens for it because our our favorite writers are there our favorite academics are there like and it's the same at least at least I like feel like I am following a lot of people that I can trust but then it's like jammed in with people I went to high school with who are like very firmly Zionist you know so it's a very weird experience thanks Caroline for anybody who didn't pick up on it Caroline is also a librarian <laughs> Um, I remember it. I don't think we talked about doing progressive stack this time. Are we, should we still be doing that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, we've been doing for the previous cozy sessions, we've been doing a progressive stack where we take, uh, questions and comments from students and from people with Palestinian her heritage first. So if you hold those identities, you can add an asterisk to the front of your name and we'll bump you up on the stack. Otherwise the next Jonathan. person. Yeah. Oh, I, I think there was someone with an asterisk above me then. Would Liz? She has an asterisk. Oh no, I think that was a that was a um correction from a previous comment. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, so I just I think I just was gonna, you know, take my time and share sort of my perspective on misinformation, because this is a topic that I I think I've put a lot of time into over the last like 20 years or something. Um, and I I remember hearing, a, what do you call it? Like a parable or a story about three blind men who came across an elephant and all three of them touched, you know, were to describe the elephant. And one of them touches the tusks and sees, oh, this is like a, a spear. And one touches the the tail of the elephant and describes it as a serpent while the third touches you know the belly and describes it as a wall and i think there's a lot of truth to that story in our current era that there are oftentimes many different perspectives that all can be true but all are not a complete picture to a story and the way I reflect that in how I consume media is that I try to have a diversity of viewpoints in what I read. Like I, I go to, I, I have some like in social media that's created for news things, but like my regular readings, I like to go to NPR or the Washington Post, but to kind of balance that, I put an effort into following conservative voices like Ben Shapiro, who I know spouts off, I, I would just say hateful messages and also misinformation, but having my mindset, listening to what he is saying and knowing there is some kernel of truth to what he is saying as well. And he might see misinformation on the other side keeps me on guard and when i am listening to other sources it keeps me in a better practice of not believing everything that i listen to or that i read and for me this is like a very it's just a different perspective but i try to listen to things that i know like like i don't i'm not here recommending and I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's like a YouTube guy and he puts a lot of crap out there. But I think listening to him keeps me in balance, knowing that no one person or one field or one perspective contains a complete truth. And it just kind of like, how do you say, like, keep the keep the blade sharp or something. What's that phrase? Like, uh you know what I mean? Like you're you're always on edge and always ready for anything. And to me, that's a very important perspective to when confronting misinformation, because there is misinformation on progressive and conservative sides. It It's not just conservatives that have misinformation. And I think we too quickly see the misinformation of one side while neglecting the misinformation of ourselves. And that's applied to, I think, both progressives and conservatives, because in conservative circles, 
they point out all the misinformation of the left while declining all of their own. And I think that's that's just what I wanted to to share. Nathan, you're up on stack. I I haven't seen other stacks, so go ahead, Nathan. Hello. Um, and again, I want to thank everybody who uh, put these cozy series together because I don't know, I learned a whole bunch. Um, I think at the beginning when I started, I was um, like worried about like how we talked about it. And I think like part of my apprehension came because I didn't know how to talk about it. Um, and for me, um, one of the, the areas that I go to, I always like to go to books because I think they're long, they're long form there's more time and more effort that have people have put it into thought. So the books, so that's where I started and I'm still on the journey, but I want to talk about two books that I, I've read since. Um, and let me get them. So the first one that I went to in to me, like, um, I don't know, like you, we go to t things that we identify with for the most part. So the first one that I did was black power in Palestine, the transnational countries of color by Michael R. I think it's Fishback. Um, and to me, this was really good because it really showed the power. Um, it showed how the uh, the civil rights movement in like the 60s was attached uh, to the Palestinian power. And I believe at the convention in 68, like there was a group, a black group that wanted to sign up with the Democrats. But because of their position on, on Palestine, the black group did not do that. And one of the quotes that was in this book and this is the quote, so sorry for the language, but that really hit me in this book was an African-American who went to Palestine in the 60s. And he said, anyone who goes to Palestine will know that they are the niggers of the Middle East. And to me, that was something that I had to, because I don't, I don't think that was more like, that's just how the Jews are feeling. I think it's the whole situation. So I really had to go back and look about how this position or like how this all started. And then the next book that I read um, was from a Palestinian author. Uh, his name, uh, I read The Hundred Years War on Palestine, a history of settler colonialism, uh, excuse me, a history of settler colonial conquest and resistance from 1919, no, excuse me, 1917 to 2017. And yeah, I just think this one, and it's still, it ha I have so many more questions because, uh, yeah, I feel like the more you look, the more questions you end up having, and it becomes very complicated. But for me, this series has uh, inspired me to read more. I still have more questions, and it just made me more aware in general. I think it's, I don't know, I, I, I just believe that we should be probably reading more books. I don't think I mean, it's a, this is such a complicated um, history. Like I, to me, like, you know, this 1917 to 2017, it's like, you know, this goes back further than that. Like, like, so there's so much more. Um, so, yeah, I just want to uh, thank everybody who did this and yeah, appreciate you. Thanks, Nathan. I, I want to add a thing to that. I, First off, appreciate the plug for reading a book. We have some in the library. <laughs> Please go get them. We have electronic books too. And as it turns out right now, very sadly and unfortunately in our city, you can't get books from the public library. So remember, um, we're here. Uh, I, I want to add to your comment, Nathan, about the complicated history. I was at the Long Walk for Palestine two weeks ago with many folks in this um, Zoom space. And there was a young Palestinian girl in front of me and she had made a sign for herself on cardboard that said, read history. And at first I was like, yes, yes, read history, read history. And then I was like, oh wait, whose history are you gonna read? So this gets back to this question of the master narrative and the counter narrative. And for us all remembering that there are some seriously problematic history textbooks out there in the world. So what I hear you saying, Nathan, is like connecting a, a history narrative of this place to your identity and affirming like your beliefs 
and a history that connects with your beliefs. And I truly love that. So we put links to those books in the chat. And I don't know if anyone else is on stack. Or wants to talk. Is Elisa Betta, did you stack? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted to say a few things though. I mean, sometimes it's very easy to recognize a, a bad narrative. Like, you know, you you can see like Ben Shapiro, for example, you can tell that um, he's a hater <laughs> and so on. But I think that there is narratives that is even more dangerous because it's portrayed as like with beautiful words and meaningful like peace and so on. But without telling the whole story, and so we are all uh, attracted by these uh, beautiful intentions of peace, of creating peace, etc. But erasing uh, the oppression that is really, like in case of Israel Palestine, the root cause of the problem. So I remember, like just a few weeks ago, my mom told me, "Oh, I saw this person who was talking about. I really liked him and so on." And then um, I didn't know him. I forgot his name, but I. I searched it up, I was like, oh my God, no, no, no. He's totally talking about that type of peace without uh, addressing the issue. So it's it, what he was talking about, the status quo. But so I feel like this is even more dangerous because we don't see it clearly unless we have a, a background of knowledge. Then I, I also want to mention that other sources of, uh, uh, you know, information are documentaries and, um, I've seen uh, several, a few very interesting documentaries uh, about Palestine, um, like for example, Naila and the uprising. Um, it gave me like a very, you know, perspective of uh, the role of women during the first intifada. We hardly ever hear about women, especially like the, we have this stereotype of Palestine, like probably sexist and uh, like all, you know, you know we have like these bias, biases and so on. Instead, like women like really played like a huge role in uh, the political scene and so on. And anyway, so I say just, you know, documentaries are also a great source of information. Of course, like what documentary to look at and so on. And other people that I, I, I try to follow uh, or to listen to are, like, for example, Israeli people, journalists who have been in uh, Gaza, have done like extensive work uh, on the ground. Like, uh, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, Gideon Levy? Gideon Levy? I don't know. Do you know him? And then I, there is another one that I forgot. Uh, uh, um, she was interviewed Just by Amy Goodman. And, Amira, and... Amira Haas, maybe? Yes, Amira, Amira, Amira Haas. Haas. And, you know, so then you you know that they are Israeli, so like you feel like, you know, they, they know that point of view, but also they've been on the ground and, and so they can really talk uh, about uh, uh, those issues. Um, yeah, and also like to, to stress on what uh, you have said about New York Times, it is so disappointing. And I don't know the, the fact that uh, they did not retract uh, um, all the articles that are um, used to justify the, the genocide. I mean, for me, it actually, there is no justification, but for, in some people's mind, um, that is what is used. And I don't know how is that possible? How can we can uh, call for accountability? I mean, it's it's like, I don't know. To me, it's like, uh, it blows my mind. Um, anyway, that's it. Rain, do you want to go ahead? Hi. Um, so I've been listening, enjoying all that. But I also was thinking a little bit about as awesome as it is to, and especially it makes sense since you're librarians, to drop a bunch of sources for, hey, here's maybe a more trusted source or here's more of a better way to look at this. I really feel like sometimes the best thing for dealing with misinformation is understanding like framing and how things are framed. And so like you could take the exact same occurrence of say the United States dropped some aid boxes into the ocean and a bunch of people ran to 
go get them. And then a bunch were mowed down and shot and then some more drowned. And one article, like the headline is, oh, hey, Americans dropped aid to Palestinians. And then the next article, the headline is, oh, some civilians, you know, drowned. There was like two people who drowned. And there's no mention of anyone who was shot. There's no mention of a lot of the things that go on in the circumstance because of the framing behind the message that's trying to be sent forward. And as awesome as good sources are, or as awesome as good links are, a sense of like critical thinking and understanding how to absorb framing and try to look at what kind of narrative is being taught here or who's pushing, who's making money off of this, like who's actually benefiting from this. Um, having that kind of really strong sense of critical thinking is like, you mention it some, but I feel like, I don't know. I, I Do you get what I'm saying? Like the emphasis on it, it like I feel like could be a little stronger. Yeah, I wonder, it, does that sort of, um, it kind of reminds me of what, was it Caroline who was talking about trusting yourself or... I think that's part of it where it's like you're you're developing your ability to critically read something like the New York Times um, and notice what they're not talking about and notice what language they're using and kind of trust yourself to like make that analysis. I don't know if maybe you guys ever would be up for it, but maybe like having some sort of workshop at you know, the library for people who want to learn critical thinking skills or learn about framing and give examples of articles about the exact same situation and give examples in that way where you can see here's this narrative being pushed, here's this narrative being pushed, the exact same situation, but it's viewed in such differing ways. Um, and here's how to look for indications of this, or here's how to adjust your, when you see things like this. I don't know if that would be like something of interest to you guys, but I, I don't know. That's what came to my mind. Not only is it of interest, Rain, it is our job. We do it all the time. Ask your instructors for a library workshop near you. <laughs> Cool, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, where are we at? 12.55. And did we miss any stacks? Or does anyone want to say a thing that they wrote in the chat? It, what um, I, Ray is the person who just spoke, I think. What that makes me think of is um, being in class because we, we teach evaluation of information pretty regularly, but it really rain. It, it really depends on how much time we have. Um, like it might be a one fifty minute session or you might have three sessions with the class. And like most commonly we work with English 102. I have had students go so deep on the who's paying for this. And they were like, I went to the publisher and then you know who owns that and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dang. <laughs> um, so that it's just kind of like a reminder to me that sometimes I feel like the way that we teach evaluation is um, incomplete, inadequate, you know, because of a time constraint or because of how like, deep your critical thinking analysis really has to go to incorporate everything that is part of the experience of creating and consuming information but like even just like accuracy authority bias currency relevance like that gets to what rain was describing like um that critical analysis it's just something that gets the more you practice it like you're not going to be able to you know do a full pigeon pose the first time you try yoga <laughs> you know so it's like the it is so much more work it's so much more thinking to to evaluate information but it is a practice and it gets to become more natural um so 
Yeah, but it, it's also very tiring. So it's, uh, you don't have time to do that. Like every time you're just trying to take a brace, break and scroll your phone or whatever. But that's why social media has been so overwhelming recently because it's like, oh, here's this cool recipe. Here is genocide. And um, it's just like uh, being intentional, being intentional when you begin engaging with information I think is is the habit to create that allows you to use your critical analysis um, but it's hard to undo everything the, the way you do it thanks Caroline I think oh really go ahead uh, I don't know if I can be heard. Uh, I think it's working. I was thinking about um, like finding information by myself versus having like a book group or people that I talk to about information gathering and how that is sort of centering for me. I think I, I think it's possible to access a lot of information that like I trust, but also to like spin in just my own head feels uh, it's weird and alienating if nobody around me is reading or accessing the same sorts of information. So I think there's, you know, the thought of, oh yeah, am I creating an echo chamber of my own design? But also I think there's valuable stuff in having a buddy and just like being able to map um the things that you're feeling right now in another literal person hopefully somebody you care about um and seeing that like oh yeah i care about this other person who is learning about these same things that i am and that looks like this and them and it probably looks like this and me and it helps me get a better picture of what i look like in that situation and how i want to care for somebody else who is also in that situation A wonderful way to end. Thank you so much. All, all of you. I don't know what else to say. This this whole cozy series and seeing all of you return week after week has been such a great experience. It's also been a big like behind the scenes. Greta and I have really been up front, but we have at our backs, well, all of you. And Elisa, Althea, Adriana, Dave Ellenwood have been behind the scenes. Uh, Jesse Hernandez also behind the scenes, um, just making sure that we're all in a space where we can talk about controversial things and get clarity for ourselves. And now, hopefully, after next week, we all have some time to rest. And I recommend, like, don't read something for a day. <laughs> Try to quiet your mind and see what happens. <laughs> and then, um, like Willie said, join a book group or something like that. Okay. Or Thanks. an organization. Or an, or organization. an activism. Yes. Build relationships. Do that. Get in your communities, folks. That's what I'm hearing. Okay, um, love to you all. Jean, did you ever, wait, I guess we have to close. I I think that's great. Jean, email us if you did really have something that you wanted to bring up. And everyone take care. I hope you all get through finals successfully and we'll see you again soon.